Hello, everybody. I'm Jeremiah Vardaman with the University of Wyoming Extension, and you are joining Barnyards and Backyards Live. We are so grateful for you to be here. Uh, we got a great presentation today, uh, but before we get to that, my co-host is Abby Perry. Good morning, Abby. How are you doing? Good morning. Doing well, thank you. Good. The other, the other person that you will not see but may hear is Jenny Thompson. She keeps the background uh, is behind the background of Barnyards and Backyards logo, and she keeps us on task and, and connected up and everything functioning in the background. We really appreciate her work. Thank you, Jenny. Our guest today is Jeff Edwards. He's a UW Extension horticulture specialist and also has other hats that he does for the university. Good morning, Jeff. How are you? Good morning, Jeremiah and Abby. Glad to be here. We've, we've flipped the tables a little bit on everybody, haven't we? <laughs> Yes, and, and you're probably like when your eye starts twitching, that people will know why because you usually do the introduction. <laughs> oh, no, oh no, I have no criticism whatsoever, <laughs> Jeremiah. That's awesome. <laughs> so, but before we get to our show, uh, want to just do some housekeeping. So, if you're joining us either Facebook Live or or through Zoom, you can interact with us. Bring us your questions forward. You'll have to type them into the the chat box or in the Q&A box, if you're new to Zoom, if you roll your mouse across the bottom of the screen, they, they pop up and the buttons are there. If you're on Facebook Live in the comments section, if you'll do that, Jenny's watching that and will bring those questions forward for us. Uh, beyond that, we're just gonna jump into it. So today we're gonna be talking about insect management in enclosed spaces, if we use the federal term, but inside of high tunnels, greenhouses, geodesic domes, any type of growing space indoors, you may run into these potential insect pests. Without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Jeff. Let's, let's get this kicked off. Okay, thanks guys. I'm gonna immediately uh, uh, share so that we can get going. Um, and the reason for that is I have a lot of information in a short amount of time, so. <laughs> Which means Jeff cannot follow instructions to keep it short and simple. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're exactly right, Jeremiah. Thanks. <laughs> uh, so as Jeremiah said, we're going to talk about insect management in enclosed spaces. And um, just going to dive right in. If you have questions, please ask them. And uh, just a reminder, this is uh, what we're talking about. A high tunnel, a hoop house, a geodesic dome, uh, some greenhouses. Uh, uh, well, greenhouses, if you uh, have them, that, it, that qualifies too. Um, but uh, just an enclosed space. Um, so what we're really going to focus on today is uh, looking for the bad guys, right? What's what's actually showing up in your enclosed space on your plants? Uh, and I put the best defense is a good offense. Well, sometimes the best offense is a good defense. So it's, uh, it's really important that you have a plan in place. Uh, realize that eventually you will have problems in these spaces as far as uh, insects and mites and those types of things. Uh, and to me, the best defense for any type of uh, pest problem in an enclosed space is healthy, well-watered, well-fertilized plants. Um, and, you know, you're paying attention to them. Is it, if you wander out there in the middle of the afternoon, is it really scorching hot? Uh, are your plants stressed? Do you have too much sun coming in? Uh, in most greenhouses, they'll whitewash the, the, uh, the glass on the inside to try to cut down on the amount of light that's coming in. Um, and so, uh, we can do that with, high tunnels and hoop houses and geodesic domes by using shade cloth and those types of things. So uh, there's there's just kind of a lot of things going on that uh, in these structures that doesn't normally happen outside. But this is not really that new, right, Jeff? I mean, no. we talk about this with outside gardens or outside plants, any plants that we're growing, the healthier and happier you keep those plants, the better they are at combating pests, right? Like yes. insects. The, yes. the big thing for us in Wyoming specifically, we're not used to dealing with certain pests because of our arid outdoor climate, right? But then right. once we, we get intelligent and put a greenhouse or a high tunnel or geodesic dome up and we flip that paradigm, which allows those pests to show up and you're going to yeah. talk about them today. Yeah, things start happening, right? It's just, uh, 
So the best defense for uh, weeds in your lawn is a healthy turf, right? So right. it's it's the same type of concept. If your plants are healthy in your greenhouse, you're less likely to have problems. And so we're looking at stress to that plant, right? Yeah, so like you right. talk about water stress, fertility stress, too high a temperature, wind, all that. Much, we're trying to manage that. Believe it or not, in Wyoming, too much sunlight can be a problem. And we, we are close to the sun in comparison to other parts of the nation. <laughs> and, and have many sunny days, yes. Yeah. yeah. And that just intensifies inside of a structure. So uh, the most important thing to be doing is uh, scouting your plants, monitoring your plants, taking a look at them, you know, uh, use your eyes. And as we age, we sometimes have uh, poorer and poorer eyesight. It might be a good idea to find a 10x magnifying uh, lens of some sort to help you look at things. Use, I put use your fingers in here. Don't be afraid to touch the plants. Don't be afraid to take a leaf off of a plant, but make sure you turn it over and look at the bottom. I think that's uh, uh, kind of a critical thing to do. Most of these insect pests that we're going to talk about today hang out on the underside of the leaves. Hang out, live, feed, lay eggs, those types of things. Uh, use sticky traps to monitor. And I've got an image here. I'll show you what I'm talking about in a minute. And then uh, keep some records, it, whether they're mental notes um, or you write things down. I'm not organized enough to uh, write things down. I always have good intentions of writing things down and keeping track of stuff. But eh, I, I try to remember and Sometimes my memory isn't the best, so I probably should write things down more. I would the, highly encourage people to write it down. If nothing else, get a calendar that, that is just for the, your growing space and write it on the calendar, whatever. And why I say that is because it never fails that people come into my office and talking to me about what they did. And I'll ask, okay, well, when did that happen? When did, what did you do then? And what, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. That was, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, we just would, don't remember. There's lots. That would going be on. that would be my answer, Jeremiah. I don't know. I did it, but I don't remember when. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, and this is one of the things that I want to emphasize is that you need to do this stuff every time you're in your high tunnel or you're in in your unclosed space. Uh, you know, look at your plants, pull a weed or two, take care of problems that you might have, those types of things. So I threw this picture in here just because this particular individual, he's doing what he's supposed to be doing. He's scouting. He's got a leaf in his hand. He has a magnifying lens in his hands. And in this particular structure, they have these yellow uh, sticky cards hung up. And um, uh, they there's a product out there that's called Tanglefoot. And you can make your own sticky traps. <clears throat> But make sure you don't get the stuff on you. <laughs> it's it's really it's kind of like um, it's very similar to Gorilla Glue. If anybody's messed around with Gorilla Glue, it's really hard to get off. Uh, but um, if you hang these cards up, you can monitor for flying pests. So things like thrips and aphids and and those types of things will show up in these sticky cards so that you can manage and and try to get an idea that hey yeah there is a problem out there. You can buy these things commercially. Um, and you know, it's a whole lot easier than making your own, might be a little bit more expensive, those types of things. There's some trade-offs there, but anyhow. A question on that, Jeff. Yep. So these sticky cards or sticky traps, sometimes they come in a ribboning, like a, a ribbon that's an inch wide or some tape. Yeah. Yep. Um, so those, those traps are, do they have pheromones in them or are they just by chance that the insect runs into them? So some of them do. So you have to, it, it depends on what you're trying to uh, monitor for, but most of them are just kind of in a, uh, the yellow color, most, think about it, right? We've talked about healthy plants. Unhealthy plants are kind of yellowish. They're kind of off color. So this is kind of an attractant to, just, just a visual attractant to uh, a lot of these pests. So there are different colored um, sticky cards particularly for thrips, because thrips are attracted by blue and, and different light. Uh, so, um, you know, there are, are there are different cards out there, but the yellow ones are primarily the ones that you would use, that we would use uh, in our structures. Jeff, if you see some of these insects in one of your spaces, do you assume that they're in all of them? Or are there certain conditions that make it so that maybe they really are only inhabiting like one of your 
you know, assuming that you, if you had multiple structures. Yeah, if you had multiple structures, uh, it's possible that they might be in an isolated uh, unit. Um, but if that's the case, then you always work in that one last. Okay. Right? So that would that would be a, a management um, tool, right? So uh, you're trying to prevent hitchhikers from going from one place to another. So if you know that you have a pest in one structure, go to it last. Do what you need to do in it last. So that would prevent those hitchhikers from moving around. Do or you also slow them down. do you have to worry about? I mean if you have these enclosed spaces, but then, you know, maybe you have spaces that are just outside and in the open, do you have to worry about taking your hitchhikers from your enclosed space into the rest of your gardens as well? Yeah, you do, particularly with the pests that we're going to talk about today. Um, uh, however, you know, there's a whole lot of other things going on on the outside of a structure yeah. that are probably biological control, biological management type tactics that yeah. are just happening in nature. So um, your, uh, your infestation level might be less, your uh, overall issue outside might be less, but they Thank can you. still happen outside. So, you know, the last thing that I want to say is if you're not looking and you get to a point where, oh, I think I might've messed up. I've got aphids really bad. That's usually what people, that's usually how they first notice them is that there's a problem and it's a really bad problem. So if you're scouting and you're monitoring and you're taking care of things immediately, the less likely that you'll have this kind of a problem uh, showing up in your enclosed spaces. You're, you're trying to do things about it. Do you have as, a- I, As soon as you- Go notice, ahead, yeah. I was gonna say, do you have a threshold that you wait for it to get to a certain point and then this is the threshold and now you do something? Or is it as soon as something shows up, you're, you're taking care of it and eliminating? Uh, do I have a threshold? I think thresholds uh, change for individual growers, right? Um, it, and I think that kind of leads into some of the other things. I, in my structure, in my hoop house, I have a perpetual aphid problem. Uh, I know they're gonna be there. Uh, I know I need to do something about them and it's all timing. I travel a lot, I might miss an opportunity to take care of something and then I have to really be a little more aggressive, those types of things. Uh, but if people are around and they're checking things out and you see aphids or any of these other things that we're gonna talk about today, you need to take care of them as soon as possible. So there are thresholds. There are probably published thresholds, uh, but I don't, I don't have access to any of those. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, so um, <clears throat> today, iso uh, insects, mites, and isopods. Oh my! Right. That's kind of what we're talking about. Uh, and then, welcome to the world of exceptions. Um, so, everything that you think you know about biology applies and yet doesn't apply to insects. <laughs> so uh, there's just a lot of weird stuff that bugs do that nothing else out there really does. So uh, that's kind of, we'll, we'll talk about that as we go. And then I'd like to say that any mention of a particular product by a manufacturer doesn't mean that I'm endorsing the use of it. It just means I'm using it as an example, okay? All right, so we're going to talk about uh, pests with piercing, sucking mouth parts first. And uh, in general, there's a lot of them. Uh, so they normally feed and lay eggs on the underside or hidden areas of plants. So they'll, they might be uh, feeding at the meristem or the top of the plant on the underneath side of the leaves. You got to lift those leaves up and look for them and find them. Some of the damage indicators that you might see when we're looking at these things, uh, first of all, they're, these insects are phloem feeders uh, and they have a waste product that's called honeydew and it uh, is ejected from their bodies and well, actually they, they flick it. They use their hind legs and they flick it away from their bodies and the, the rest of the colony. And so it's a really sugary, sappy substance that will stick to other parts of the plant, okay? And this, this happens in our trees, this happens in the garden, it happens, aphids feed on a wide variety of hosts. So 
uh, you might find honeydew in a weird, lot of weird places, okay? Uh, the result of honeydew is a substance called black mold or sooty mold. And you might, you might be able to tell from this uh, image, it, I recognize that it's a little fuzzy, but the sooty mold is not infesting the plant. You can see that it's flaking off of this one leaf. It's actually growing on the honeydew, but it's not really infesting the plant. So it's not like it's a disease that's affecting the plant, okay? Uh, ants might be one of the first things you notice, like, hey, I got an ant problem in my garden. Mm, no, probably not. You probably got a different kind of problem in your garden. So ant, ants harvest the honeydew. It's a carbohydrate source for them. So they'll actually farm aphids and move them from plant to plant and, and uh, start new colonies elsewhere so that they have this carbohydrate source. And they prevent predators from consuming aphids. So hold on, uh, Jeff. Yep, hold on. Go. We have a question. Will there be a document we can print that will have the information you are sharing today? And yes, there is an extension bulletin that Jeff has written on this, and we're highlighting it in this BNB live show. And, and I'll just ask Jenny when she has a chance to throw a link to that publication in the chat box and in the comments box so people can see this. We will also be sharing it later so you can have this information. So don't be scrambling at home trying to write this all down. This is being recorded. You can come back and watch it again, too. So, but yeah, uh, we didn't cover that at the beginning, but Jeff does have a great publication that goes over all this information then. Take lots of notes. <laughs> 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 yeah, I apologize. I should have mentioned that to begin with. Okay. Um, this is another thing that happens. So uh, when, when aphids are feeding, the plant will respond to that feeding and... Uh, the plant will actually start to change how it grows. So um, sometimes these insects, so I, I, I talk about aphids, but sometimes these insects have, uh, uh, their saliva is toxic. Uh, and so it induces some of these things. It'll induce this, it'll induce um, uh, uh, galls uh, on certain plants, not normally in your garden, but this is this is kind of a precursor to that, right? So and this is with um, all those piercing sucking mouth part pests, right? Yeah. And at least the picture you showed me before, if there wasn't aphids on there, I might be assuming that's herbicide damage. Yes. Right? That puckering, yep. curling, twisting kind of appearance is, is similar to a herbicide injury, but this is caused by piercing sucking mouth part. Yeah. This looks like a growth regulator, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 So something like 2,4-D could look, could mimic this exact same damage. Okay. Are those insects going to continue to hang out there or do they, I mean, it seems like those populations just grow and grow and grow on that same spot, but is there a chance that you go out and you do see damage like that and the insects aren't there anymore? And so you are trying to figure out if those are herbicide or insect? Yes, okay. it is. It is possible that you had a group of predators, ladybugs in particular, come through and cleaned all these up, uh, or you had a rainstorm and it knocked them all off, or some other kind of weird thing happened and knocked all the uh, all the insects off. It could happen. And then you're going, oh man, I think my plants got sprayed. Weird, weird stuff, right? Biology. Uh, and then, you know, if you have a really bad infestation, you just kind of let it go, you went on vacation for two weeks, <laughs> those, those kind of things. Uh, the plants lose their turgor, they turn brown, and they eventually will die, okay? So to be kind of a little bit more specific, we're going to talk about individual pests with piercing, piercing sucking mouth parts. Let me enunciate. Uh, and, oh, excuse me, the last thing I wanted to say here is um, that they are, these are all phloem feeders. So uh, it, everybody understands how the mouth parts of mosquitoes work, right? You know, they... They kind of, they, everybody's experienced a mosquito bite. Um, so these guys are kind of the same thing, similar but different. I mean, they are actually going uh, with these stylet type mouth parts down through the different layers of the plant to try to get to the phloem. They will feed a little bit on some of these other layers. And uh, if they have 
toxic saliva or those types of things it'll get into these other layers and that's what causes a, a whole lot of weird things but they are really good vectors of plant diseases so if you have a if you do have a diseased plant someplace or there was a diseased plant someplace else that they fed on they pick that disease up and then the next time they if they migrate or move then they move that disease to someplace else when they feed okay jeff hold on yeah. on that phloem can you explain the phloem just, yeah just so we're clear so uh plants have basically have a piping plumbing network that consists of xylem and phloem and the xylem basically transport water transports water from the roots to the leaves and the phloem uh, in a leaf it, its primary job is to make photosynth or its primary job is to photosynthesize and make sugars which are redistributed throughout the plant and then those sugars are transported in the flow yep and so that's why they have that sticky substance they're feeding on the sugar out of the phloem and the phloem is the network within the plant to distribute sugars from the leaves from photosynthesis yeah, it's just like our veins, right? Yep. Think of a mosquito yep. Yep. tapping into a vein. That's what they're doing. Perfect. Yep. Okay. All right. So let's talk about aphids. Aphids are really weird. Uh, they are, uh, they have the ability to re reproduce sexually, right? So there's male and females. Uh, and usually that happens in the fall of the year when conditions get really bad. So when that plant is in decline, they start producing these winged adults, males and females. They go off and they mate. The females find a place where they can lay eggs, usually the eggs over winter. And then the next generation that comes out the following spring are reproducing without, I mean, they no longer have to mate. They reproduce without the benefit of males. They give birth to live young, uh, which is really weird. So you might be able to, let me see if I can, Pick the highlighter here. There it is. So in these two Im images, they're re reproducing parthenogenically, which means to give birth to live young. Okay, right. So you uh, you have an egg. It produces a nymph. Right. The the nymph hatches from the egg, and when that nymph reaches maturity, it already has enough individuals in it to keep producing up to thirty generations okay of live little babies <laughs> that grow into bigger babies and suck the the good stuff out of your plants and that's um, why it's an explosive population right right uh, under rabbit yeah under perfect uh, or or the optimal uh conditions for aphids is about 80 degrees and 50 or 60 percent uh humidity and under those conditions they can uh, double their population every three days. Holy cow. Okay. So so when I said at the very beginning to scout every day or every time that you're in your high tunnel or greenhouse or enclosed space, uh, that's why it's really important. These things can really explode and take off quickly. Uh, it's, it's crazy how quickly they can reproduce. In um, a day or two, right? Yeah. Like, they weren't there yesterday and today they're everywhere. Right. And so uh, you need to have in the back of your mind how you're going to prevent them, take care of them. And by take care of them, I mean, control them. <laughs> not help them. <laughs> yeah, not help them. Yeah, you're not, don't, don't bring ants in intentionally, right? Um, and so uh, aphids occupy a whole bunch of niches, right? They, they, the, this image down here in the lower right-hand corner, that's aphids that are living on the roots of a plant. So they live on roots, they live on stems, they live on leaves, they're everywhere. And they're uh, different colors. And right? they're different some colors. Some are black, some are green, some are red, yeah. yellow, what? All, Blue? All kinds. Yeah, bluish green. Yeah. Um, so uh, when you, uh, for, for those of you who are listening and watching, if you go to an extension office and say, hey, I've got aphids, <laughs> uh, and you describe them by color, that really won't help us. We need we need either a picture or a sample. We need to know what they're feeding on, what plant they're, they're feeding on. But in general, 
everything's pretty much the same about aphids uh, as far as life cycle, uh, how they feed, the damage they cause, those types of things. Okay. And they have um, a wide host range. They have a wide host range. Yeah. So, so some of these things are really host specific. They, they only feed on one particular plant. Others are pretty much generalists. The ones that we have in our gardens, these little green ones, usually the, the green ones, <laughs> are the ones that are really common in our garden. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, uh, some management control tactics for aphids. Uh, predatory insects. So when I was younger and uh, going to grad school, I spent a whole lot of time uh, working with aphids and predators and trying to understand the dynamics of that population. Um, but it's really important, you know, when we think of predatory insects for aphids, we think of the typical red, late, red and black lady beetle. But I got to tell you, lady beetles come in all styles, all colors, those types of things. And it's really important to understand their life cycle uh, so that you don't get them confused with something else. So, you know, you have this adult lady beetle, and it's white, not typical of what you would normally see. Uh, they can be orange, um, just solid black. They can be all sorts of different colors, big, small. Uh, but their eggs are these nice yellow clustered uh, eggs. They, uh, too, will lay them um, usually on the underside of a plant, usually next to a colony of aphids. Um, and then when their larvae e emerge from this, this is the larva of a lady beetle. Doesn't look anything like an adult. Uh, they, they're kind of, when they walk, they're kind of uh, robotic, I think, is a good way to, to describe it. And um, the larva of lady beetles are uh, described as being or called uh, alligators. So they kind of, they're kind of robotic when they move, but man, to watch them move through a colony of aphids and consume 40 or 50 of them, uh, it's kind of cool, but I'm a nerd. So uh, anyway, we have a comment, Jeff, and I think it goes back to the aphid. I might have uh, been a little late catch it. But oh, OK. A, a Facebook comment came in and said, no wonder why aphids are so horrible. I put in the <laughs> aphids. They said, no wonder why they're so horrible. I think they're talking about the aphids. Yes, yes. Yeah. But now we're talking a little bit about the good guys. So um, uh, uh, lady beetles have complete metamorphosis, so that means that they actually go through a resting phase, and this is the pupil stage. So they're during that time, they are converting this body shape to end up to look like this body shape. Okay, so from the larval to the adult form. Yep. Adult form. Yep. 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 Exactly. So uh, predators are kind of fun. There's a whole lot of them out there, uh, and then I might not get to this, but remind me at the end. Well, I can just talk about it now. Uh, because I'll if remind I remind you now, talk about if it I don't, now. I'll forget. Um, <laughs> so there are some specific things that we have to do in order to keep predators and parasites and those types of things around long enough to actually do their jobs, right? Uh, so if you per you can purchase lady beetles, and in the the uh, bulletin that I have that's available, uh, I have. Uh, resources or sources where you can purchase lady beetles from and there's a lot of catalogs we get you can see them too but what they do is they uh, the predators in particular they um, have a behavior called aggregation so in the fall they go to this place that's really high we have we have this in the mountains in wyoming but where you can stumble across these clusters of lady beetles in the fall well the folks who uh, sell them know where these places are and they'll go harvest them uh, and then put them in a cooler and then when you, as a producer, order them, uh, they will arrive, they'll, they have been cooled down, and you think, oh, cool, my lady beetles are here, and just go put them out in your space. Well, they, they warm up, wake up, and then they fly away because they think that they're still in the mountains and they need to disperse back to where the food might be. So it's really important that you, if you have infested plants, that you cage these with those plants so that you can get the adults to lay eggs. And that's critical, okay? So for about a week, cage them with the plants, uh, cage them with a plant with hosts in there, and then you can be sure that they will be around for, for multiple generations. Even, even in a structure, even in even our in high tunnels and that, 
that's not enough of a cage to keep them in the space. You got to do it oh. within the plant. Yeah, because what will happen is they'll end up in the corners or in the vents or wherever you, whatever you have in your structure, they'll, they're trying to get away from where they were. But if they can get to a place where there's food, they'll hang around and lay eggs. Yeah. Okay. So other predators that are kind of cool. Uh, these are lace wings. You may have seen these out flying around. They're not really very good flyers. <laughs> uh, yeah, they, they're really poor flyers, actually. Um, they... When they lay, these are such efficient predators um, that uh, uh, when they, they don't lay a cluster of eggs like a lady beetle does, they actually lay individual eggs on a stalk that this larva has to crawl down and move away from the egg, other eggs. Um, so uh, if they did lay them in an egg mass, the first one out would be the only one out. It would eat all of its broodmates. Okay. Um, so that's kind of, they're hungry. They come out, they're hungry. Uh, these things will bite you. Uh, it's not terribly unpleasant, but I wouldn't encourage that you that you do it a lot. They do also have complete metamorphosis. They pupate. And you might have seen these things. They can be confused with a lot of other things, but they actually will roll up in a ball, uh, spin, a con spin a cocoon a little bit to kind of stick it to themselves, uh, to the plant, and then it'll be stuck to the plant. So uh, that's um, lacewing. And again, these are commercially available. You can buy them. They are very cool little predators. And you probably said this, Jeff, but the big thing uh, with those two in particular, but most predators, the larva form is the most voracious. They're going to eat the most insects from my understanding. Doesn't mean the adults don't eat them. Y yeah. But it's so, just the uh, larva eat more. Yeah. They're, the larva are eating machines, right? So... Um, uh, the adult lady beetles eat aphids. The adult lacewings don't feed at all. Uh, they might feed on nectar. Or they might feed on honeydew, those types of things, but they don't, uh, they, they're not predatory. Same with these things. Uh, these are flies. I'm sure a lot of people have seen them. They're known as flower flies, hover flies. Uh, their larvae are really uh, kind of cool predators. Okay. So, uh, see here this is an egg it's just laid individually on a leaf uh the larva of course are they're flies so the larva are maggots um which you know normally we associate maggots with rotting food and dead things and uh <laughs> not for these guys these are really good predators to have around okay uh and they form these little teardrop shaped uh, uh pupa of course it's complete metamorphosis again. And then this one is just about ready to eclose from that pupil case, uh, but it, it'll, they'll change color as they go on. Um, I don't know if these are available commercially, but they're kind of fun. They're, okay, nerd coming out again. They're kind of fun to watch. <laughs> Only for people that like bugs. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Some some of our watchers might develop a new hobby. I don't know. They need to. Yes, it's and I to know about them. Know what yeah. you're looking. At. And I apologize that I'm talking fast, but I got a lot of stuff to get through to try to make it uh, worth everybody's while. Um, the other thing for um... oh, hold on, hold on. Oh, okay. a question come in. So for the flies, are the larvae the ones that eat the pests, or do the adults as well? The larvae are they are nectar feeder nectar feeders. Um, the flies, uh, it's the larvae that feed on aphids and soft-bodied insects. Yep. But okay. if we're seeing the adult forms of these, we and if we can keep them in our space long enough, we can assume that they're laying eggs and we have larvae in the, in the area too. Correct. Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, so another cool thing that's out there is parasitic wasps. You can order them also. Uh, there's a bunch of different um, types out there. There's, uh, uh, you know, there's aphelinids and braconids. And anyway, they're all wasps. <laughs> Sorry, too sciencey, i I'm sure. Um, uh, yep, way it, over my head. <laughs> <laughs> anyhow, um, uh, what happens is, so uh, the adult is out flying around, okay? It actually will sting an aphid and lay an egg inside of it. That larva will hatch inside of that aphid while it's alive and basically consume it uh, while the aphid is alive from the inside out. 
And then the larva of the um, parasite will uh, spin a cocoon on the inside of the aphid as it dies, as the aphid dies. And then it'll pupate inside of that aphid and then emerge from that aphid. So in this image, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten aphids that look relatively normal. The green the rest ones. Of, well, the green ones, yeah. The rest of these brown ones, these have been uh, infested by a certain type of parasitic wasp. Uh, they're called mummies, okay? The, the, the aphids as they're sitting on the leaf. So they, they have kind of a paper sack uh texture to them you know they're they're you can tell they're not normal i mean if you have a colony of green aphids and you see these other things in there that's not normal uh so that means that they've been infested with uh, parasites and then the other one here are these black ones this is a different type of parasite uh and again all good to have around because these things are completing their life cycle and I'm guessing that these uh, eight or nine or 10 other ones are probably infested too. Uh, it's just that they're at a different More stage. recently infested. Yes, different they stage. Gone of through the process yet. Yep. 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 Okay. okay. All right. Are we Gotta moving on? on? Okay, yep. hold on, Jeff. We okay. need to clarify some stuff on the flies. Okay. okay. So it, we, we apparently have blown some minds with flies. So <laughs> the, the flies, uh, they're flower flies. There's surfid flies. There's different types of flies that have predatory larvae that eat some of these insect pests, specifically aphids. Uh, the adults are nectar feeders. Correct. And so they do need a source of nectar for the adults to stay around. So a flowers growing in the space would help encourage them to stay and then also be able to lay eggs. Yes. Did I capture that right? Yes. And uh, so for... For surfid flies, you can uh, create like a sugary water uh, uh, nutrient source for them uh, and put it out there and, you know, put it in a bottom of a red solo cup. <laughs> Just cut the bottom inch of it off. Okay. And then put a sugar, like you would do um, uh, hummingbirds, same type of thing. Just fill that up with a sugar water substance and then they would have a, so a food source. Just Perfect. put put it somewhere in your structure, and you might need more than one. But yeah, yep. you might yep. also attract ants to that. <laughs> okay, I think we're good. Hopefully, we clarified that so we can move on. Okay, we're good. Move on. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, insecticides. Let's talk about insecticides. Anything that you apply to your plants is considered an insecticide, whether it's a horticultural oil a uh, mycotoxin like um, uh, a native fungal product that you can purchase to apply to your plants. Um, uh, but there's a bunch of different things out there. So um, uh, I just wanted to make that information available. It's also available in the publication. Okay, do I need to be more specific? No, I don't think so. so anything you apply for the control of a pest is considered a pesticide, even if it kills or is a repellent, right? And it doesn't matter if it's organically driven or synthetically driven or where it comes from or how toxic or, or non-toxic it is, it's an, insecti it's an insecticide application. Right, yes. And okay. we'll talk more about that as we go. Sounds okay. good. Okay, first pest down. Second pest, white flies. <laughs> <laughs> white flies are weird, okay? Um, I, I originally, I, I really thought in Wyoming, white flies would not be a problem. I think it was last year or the year before, my mother called me and she goes, I got these little things on my plants, what's going on? She had white flies in her tomatoes in her, uh, in her high tunnel. Um, yep. I think it was the year before. Uh, white flies really like tomatoes. Um, they really like peppers. They really like eggplant, those types of things. Um, so the thing about white flies is that they're not flies at all. They're just white flies. <laughs> they white look like little white flies. flies. That's why they're called white flies. Yeah. Right. But they're okay. not a type of fly. Right. Correct. 
So um, again, they have piercing sucking mouth parts like aphids. They're more closely related to aphids than they are flies. So they have this, uh, this egg stage, of course. Then their first instar larva is called a crawler. It moves away at it, it, it just a couple hours, and then it finds a place to settle down, and then it will go through a molt, and it will, its legs start, the next molt, its legs are highly reduced, it stops moving at all, and it basically spends the rest of its uh, life cycle in that one spot, okay? Uh, and then these instars, the, the stage between growth is called an instar, so as it goes from one nymphal larval stage to the next, that's an instar. Sorry, entomology geek stuff. I apologize for that. <laughs> no, appreciate the clarification. So then um, this last, the, they, they do kind of pupate, right? It's called a puparia. It's really not a pupa. It's kind of just, it just is a Rest phase where it's, it's just a phase where it stops feeding. It's just this flat little disc thing, and then the adult will emerge from that, okay? Um, the, this last one really kind of could look like a scale insect, but they're really, really small, okay? And then the winged adults emerge from that um, puparium thing. And when uh, I've had to deal with these in a greenhouse, like, basically, if you just tap on the plant, you, like, bump it, all of a sudden, these white flies just start flying all around, and they're very bright white. Like they're white and little and, and all about you can see is two little small wings flapping around and something in the middle. They're that small. And they're not really good flyers. No, no. They yeah. just kind of, you're right. They flap around. They don't really have a destination. They usually go back <laughs> to the place they came from. It, yeah. <laughs> but that was so, my uh, way of seeing if we had white flies was just walk around and kind of shake plants and bump plants a little bit to see if any white flies flew up. Correct. Yep. Um, and here's what they look like as adults. Okay, this this uh, this is actually the puparia resting stage. One of these individuals came out of that particular thing right there. Okay, how weird. They are weird. Poor flyers. Um, uh, so he, here's how we get them. And I'm not pointing fingers at anybody, but usually <laughs> it comes from a plant that has been purchased from a greenhouse or. You know, since they're really poor flyers, how else are we going to get them, right? Um, it's just something that maybe came from a house plant. They've hitchhiked on you from someplace else. Uh, so, you know, if you go to a greenhouse and do some shopping, I wouldn't recommend walking right back out into your enclosed space when you get back home uh, uh, immediately. Just, you know, kind of kind of be aware of those types of things. Well, and with if you buy plants to bring in, you want to quarantine those plants before you bring it in because you could infest your whole growing space if you don't quarantine them and try and clean those plants up before they come in. Yeah, and, and again, look at the plants you purchase for honeydew. It's very possible that they can have honeydew on them and you might not know it, that you brought a problem home with you, okay? Uh, usually, um, there are exceptions. <laughs> These things will not overwinter in Wyoming in an unheated structure. The cold will kill them, okay? And again- and that's the benefit, like when we do structures, right? And if it is a heated structure like a greenhouse, if you can go 30, have a period sometime during the winter where you have 30 days and you let that greenhouse freeze, that's part of your pest management strategy. Right. But if yep. you keep the heat on and grow year round, you're not breaking a cycle and not helping yourself out. Right. Um, it, yeah. Uh, uh, being kind of facetious, some of the, when somebody will ask me how I would recommend they get something under control and it might be in the middle of the winter, the best answer is to set it outside for about two days. <laughs> so, yep. I mean, you won't have a plant, but you won't have a pest problem anymore either. Uh, <laughs> it, it's the best way to get rid of it. I yep. just, I know that this is not a really good image, but I just wanted to put this out there um, to kind of give you an idea. Uh, okay, this plant is really heavily infested with a whole bunch of adults, but these little white things are eggs. Okay, so they're hanging out on the plant, they're feeding, 
they are producing eggs. They, I think it's seven to 10 days uh, before they are, you know, their, their cycle, they can cycle through from egg to adult seven to 10 days. So, well, uh, we, you didn't say this, I don't think, but like with aphids and white flies and a lot of these pests, if you are into insecticide control, no matter or organic or inorganic uh, insecticide, you're applying every week or every two weeks, whatever the label says, and you're going to have to do two, three, four applications before you get them under control, just yep. because they're that explosive of nature. So if we sprayed this, right, and controlled and had good control, you're going to control the adults, not the egg. So the best offense is a good defense. Right. Scouting, looking for stuff, looking for problems, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yep. So white fly management, biocontrol. There are predatory mites that you can buy. There are predatory insects and there are parasitic wasps, just like we talked about for aphids, okay? So this is an image of a uh, puparia of a white fly, and then this would be the parasite of the white fly. Again, these are, we're talking really tiny insects, really tiny biocontrol, right, okay? And then uh, insecticide applications, horticultural oils, and I think, uh, I don't know if Jenny has put the uh, link in she there. Did. Okay, yeah, yeah. good. So um, we've had a Barnyards and Backyards la uh, Barnyards and Backyards magazine article about specifically about horticultural oils. Uh, I suggest you read through that if you want to use those things. Uh, pyrethrins are actually an organic product. Uh, they are uh, derived from chrysanthemums. Okay, uh, and I'll show you a product label here as we go through so that you can see an example of that. And then there's several systemic synthetic insecticides that can be used for these types of things with piercing, sucking mouth parts. But I really, uh, personally, I do not like applying synthetic pesticides to my garden vegetables that I'm going to consume. Um, there's, there's some timing things where it does actually uh, make sense to do, but I will not apply uh, synthetic products to things like greens or things that are actually about ready to harvest. It's just not worth it to me. I, I won't do it. I will pull plants before I uh, apply pesticides to those types of things. Okay. Now, this next one. Um, before you move on to that one, I think that okay. there was a question about what do you do if you have ants guarding aphids? So... <laughs> I, I didn't want to get into that, but that's okay. Oh, uh, sorry. No, 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 that's okay. Um, I would recommend using a boric acid sugar water bait station uh, to and put that at the base of the plants uh, to try to get those ants under control. So if it's sugar-based, it's going to be oh. similar to honeydew. They're looking at it as a carbohydrate uh, food source. They'll come to it, they'll feed on it, then they'll carry it back to the queen. And what you're really trying to do is trying to get rid of the, uh, the queen. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and get rid of that column. Okay. Uh, okay. Are we good? Yep. Okay. Um, this is a really bizarro pest. It comes in, it doesn't show up all the time. Uh, but I wanted to bring it up because... About every two years, I get a phone call and then asks me particularly about uh, one of the symptoms that this thing leaves behind, okay? So they look like mi little mini cicadas. Uh, and when I'm talking about a cicada, uh, people in Wyoming call these um, locusts. <laughs> we in Wyoming call these locusts. These are not locusts, locusts are grasshoppers. But locusts, the things that buzz in the trees in uh, July and August, they look like this, only larger. <laughs> okay, uh, sorry, moving on. <laughs> um, the immatures can be confused with white flies, but every stage of these things are mobile. Okay, so they will move around on the plant, all right? Somebody will call and say, hey, I got this sugary white substance on my tomato plants or my potato plants. What is it? Well, these guys don't have honeydew as a waste product. They have crystalline. It's, it's a crystalline product um, that they will flick away from their colony. Uh, and it's known as psyllid sugar. Okay. Uh, 
it's a carbohydrate based, but it but it's a crystalline product. Okay. And it's not it looks a liquid like, form. It's it's a solid. No. It's a and it looks like somebody dumped a bunch of sugar on the plant. And if it gets to this stage, you really got a problem. <laughs> You've had a problem a really long time. You got a sugar factory going on on your plants. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, uh, and this is just some other data that I threw in here. Uh, Whitney Crenshaw, who was an entomologist at CSU, he's since retired. Potato psyllids can be the most damaging insect pest for tomatoes in Colorado. And we, we see this occasionally. They drift here, so they're migratory. They have to fly up from the south. They can occur in Wyoming um, and do, okay? Um, it's likely that if you have them in an in, uh, enclosed growing space, that you won't get rid of them over the course of a year, and they might be a reoccurring problem, okay? Uh, they have toxic saliva, and it, it causes the plants to turn yellow or start to fold up or roll up or those types of things. And you can't really see this here, but there's a, whole, there's a bunch of them here. They're kind of feeding along the margins. And then the whole underside of this particular leaf is covered with psyllids. So the immature stages, all right? So that's uh, tomato psyllids. It's just one of those things to be on the lookout for. So other nightshade family plants, uh, eggplants, tomatillos, and peppers can also become victims, okay? All right, so control management for psyllids. Uh, okay, so if you have a if you have a pest with piercing sucking mouth parts, let's talk about predators with piercing sucking mouth parts. Uh, these this is a damsel bug. Okay, these are really common in alfalfa fields. Uh, they're really good predators uh, to have around. Very um, very hungry. Um, and then uh, minute pirate bugs. And again, you can order these from different suppliers. Uh, so for these two predators, uh, the nymphal stages and the adult stages all feed uh, on the target. So they're all good to have around. One thing about these guys though, is if you don't have enough food for them, they'll start biting you. <laughs> minute pirate bugs, minute pirate bugs are, excuse me, very hungry and people notice them usually in the fall They'll show up in your garden spaces and those types of things, but they won't notice them until they bite you, right? So you've got this really little tiny bug on you that looks like this thing in the on the right. Uh, and it's like, hey, wait a minute, that thing, I think it just took a bite out of me. Well, yeah, it did. It's testing the water. It's hungry. It's saying, feed me more aphids. <laughs> exactly, right? Uh, yes, uh, they are very hungry in the fall. So these two are available. Um, there are some fungal pathogens available for these guys, um, the Cisaria product and Bovaria. The one thing I want to talk about, these spray-on fungal pathogens, they can be phytotoxic to the plant. So uh, mix them up according to the label directions, apply them according to the label directions. If you put them on a little bit too heavy, you could potentially kill your plant you would solve your problem but you might not have any plants left okay why do all and good then, solutions come with killing the plant yeah right yeah <laughs> don't have any plants you won't have any bugs that's that's <laughs> right. the ultimate solution right uh and so with with all fungal type diseases it's really important to have they're, they're going to be more efficacious if you have high humidity uh they they just have a tendency to work a little bit better okay which, Hold on, Jeff. We have a question about the damsel bugs and minute pirate bugs. Will those okay. work on aphids as well, or are they only good for tomato psyllids? Um, they're hungry. They eat almost anything they can catch. Uh, check the literature and see if they will feed on aphids. I think I think minute pirate bugs will, um, and I think damsel bugs will too. Okay. Yep. All right. But check. Uh, okay, um, things to spray on, horticultural oils will work, neem oils um, usually will control the nymphs because you can get them covered. And I, I, need, I did, haven't said this yet, but any product that you are applying for the control of these things, you actually have to spray the area of the leaf that they're infesting, okay? 
uh, contact insecticide, contact type activity. Um, and it's really important that you get good coverage. And then like Jeremiah said earlier, it's not just one application. It's going to be with horticultural oils. I think it's five to seven day intervals, something like that. But make sure you read the label when you're using these products and just apply them accordingly. Okay. And horticultural oils are considered a contact insecticide. Yes. Right. They they physically need to come in contact with the pest and and at least and you correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff. But horticultural oils work in the thing that they coat and cover the pest and suffocate them. Correct. They interfere with their ability to respire. Yeah. Breathe. Sorry, being a nerd again. Okay. <laughs> but if but if you don't get them covered, if you don't get good coverage of the pest, which means the bottom side of the plants where they are then it doesn't do any good and doesn't bother them, right? Yeah. It doesn't disrupt their... their right. Reaction. If you only apply to the top surface of the plant, there are some insecticides that, they, that will move through a leaf. That's called translaminar activity. But those things are really toxic and we don't want to be applying those into your garden. Uh, the things that are available to control these things, they have to come in contact. They have to be sprayed onto the pest. And those insecticides are not as toxic. They're safer, so they're better for vegetable use and edible consumption. Yeah, yeah, yep. 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 But read they're, the labels. They're they're externally applied, uh, right? They don't move. They don't move through the plant, so they can be washed off later. Right. But read okay. and apply according to the label. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so other plants with piercing, uh, excuse me, plant pests with piercing sucking mouth parts. I'm gonna run out of time. Dang it. Uh, <laughs> go faster <laughs> i'm trying i'm trying um okay so damage indicators webbing right that's a big key thing that something is wrong there if there's webbing on your plants uh flecking so these types of things they all they are individual cell feeders so they damage the surface of the leaf on a cellular level so you'll get this flecking stippled look you know, you'll see patches of brown and patches of green in one place. Uh, discoloration, there can be bronzing, scorching of the leaves, and eventually the plants uh, will die. All right, so we're going to talk about a little bit about spider mites. I hate them. I have a perpetual mm -hmm. spider mite problem in my uh, own uh, enclosed space. And usually what ha they like hot, dry conditions. Usually what happens is about the third week of July, I will go someplace. I have a meeting or something. And, you know, five days prior to that, it's like, oh, there's a little spot of webbing in my raspberry plants. Um, eh, I better do something about it. Well, I get distracted. I leave for my little trip, come back, and the population has exploded. I'm, I'm trying to catch up at that point. And it's happened multiple years in a row. I'm thinking, you know, maybe I just should give up. No. <laughs> well, and and with all these pests that you've talked about, that's how it works. Right? Yeah. They hit a period and just explode. And when you get to that point, if you're not on top of them before they explode, you play catch up for the next three to four weeks if, at a minute. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. If you that's the thing, if you notice something, you got to take care of it now. Yeah. Uh, so spider mites are not insects; they're arachnids, sort of. And the reason why I say sort of is because you have an egg stage. You have a larval stage. So most insects only have either a larval stage or a nymphal stage. Uh, and it all depends on their metamorphosis or how they mature. You'll notice that the larval stage only has six legs. So that's kind of insect-like. But the next time it, uh, it goes from one growth stage to the next, to this proto-nymph stage, uh, it has eight legs. So then it becomes kind of spider-like. It's, it's weird. So, you know, all that stuff you knew about biology. I'm blowing <laughs> out the mind. window. <laughs> yeah, blowing your mind. Um, these things are, they don't have wings, right? So they, uh, how do they spread? Through the wind, through the air. Um, spiders have a behavior that's called um, ballooning. They'll shoot out a little piece of silk. They'll climb up to a place really high. They'll shoot out a little piece of silk and then they'll float away. Um, these things do the same thing. They will also hitchhike on other plants. They'll hitchhike on your clothes, those types of things. Uh, and it, they usually overwinter. So they're around somewhere in some form in weedy areas, uh, in margins of fields and those types of things. 
Um, so uh, this is typical mite damage. Okay, you might notice uh, there's webbing up here all around the plant. And then you've got sort of green spots intermixed with sort of white spots intermixed with brown dead dying spots. Okay, uh, the plant just doesn't look good at all. Uh, so they they feed on a cellular level. Um, so let's manage them. Uh, there are some predatory mites that you can buy. Uh, I think I'm going to try this. Um, so so got nothing thing, to lose. Don't get anything to lose except maybe a few dollars, right? So the <laughs> thing about biological control, it can be very, very expensive, really fast, right? Um, and depending on the size of your structure or your infestation, you might not need a lot of predators uh, to start out with. So, you know, start small. If you think that they're doing what they need to do, maybe you can add a few more, but uh, it's an ecological balance that you're trying to get to. And, and there's always a prey species that blossoms first and the predators lag behind. So there, it's, it's kind of one of those things that you have to um, really kind of be aware of and play around with, okay? They need the food source. Right. Yeah. If if the food source isn't there, they're either going to die or leave. Yep. Right. And so right. It, that's the tough part is is we have to have a pest population enough to support the predator, and and if you don't have the pest, you won't have the predator, so to speak, right. and you won't have the predator there when the pest explodes. Kind of idea. It, it's a it's hard to balance. Exactly. Yep. Uh, again, horticultural oil will control these guys. Um, uh, insecticidal soap, uh, neem oil, rosemary and peppermint oil. So, so there's a whole lot of different things that are available out there. Uh, and if you if they get out of control and you can't, if you don't have any other options. So mites aren't insects. Insecticides don't necessarily work on them. You actually need a product that's a miticide. So the abamectin and the chlorphenopyr, chlorphenopyr are actual miticides that you can purchase to try to get things under control if you have a really bad problem. So uh, just uh, these, there all, are also fungal pathogens out there, the Cisaria and the, the, oh, that's a fungal pathogen. And then the Chromobacterium, that's a bacteria. bacteria. Yeah, let's just go there. Okay, okay. Uh, moving on. And I apologize that we're running over, uh, but hopefully people are hanging with us and we'll just keep no, going. So far we're good. Okay. Um, rasping, sucking mouth parts. All right. Uh, some of the damage indicators are going to be very similar to my, spider mites, except there is no webbing. Okay. Same type of stuff that we saw with spider mites. Okay. Well, one one thing, if you go back to that, Jeff, sorry. One thing mm -hmm. I want to point out on this, and, and we may be all thinking this, these symptoms are not a hundred percent identifying marks of insect pests. This could be nutrient deficiency. This could be yep. sun scalding, right? I mean, there's other things that can cause these exact same symptoms. And that's why you got to really look. Correct. Yep. And monitor and yeah, go on the defense. Okay. Yeah. So the thing that I'm, I'm primarily talking about here are thrips and there's an, it's an entomological oddity, but there is no single thrip. Anytime you talk about thrips, whether it's one or many, say thrips. <laughs> There's no plural or singular sound. Right. It's they're all thrips. Okay. Uh, they're small. They're cigar shaped. Uh, they don't, again, they don't fly very well. Uh, they don't cover large distances. Um, they are attracted to flowers, particularly those that are composite type flowers. So think of sunflowers, daisies, uh, those types of things. And to give you an idea of their size, this is the center portion of a daisy. So these are the composite flowers on the inside of a daisy. And then these individual cigar shaped things are thrips. Those little okay. black. Little threads. black things, little black yeah. cigars. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so their life stage, you know, they have uh, an egg stage, they have multiple uh, larval stages, and then they have two sort of pupil stages where they're really not feeding, they're kind of hanging out, uh, and then they will finally molt into this adult stage, okay? 
Um, the weird thing about the other weird thing about thrips is they really only have one mandible. They have they have so most uh, insects have two man uh, with chewing mouth parts have two mandibles. Um, so like a grasshopper, right? Like They're a grasshopper. Yeah. Mandible. Yep. Yeah. So so these things they do have two mandibles, but one is really highly reduced. And what they do is they they'll uh, walk down the surface of a leaf or a flower, and they'll scrape the surface of the leaf with that one mandible, and then they'll turn around and suck up the plant juice that's oozing out of the, the wound that they made. That's how they feed. Okay. Uh, that's why yeah. they're called a rasping mouth part. Rasping mouth part. Yep. Yeah. So things about thrips. They're poor flyers. They're kind of funny looking little things. Um, they have a wide they host magnification range. to see them. They're small. You need you need that 10x magnifier to see them. Yeah, you can have a pretty good idea that something's running around on your plant, but when they're these yellow ones and they're on a plant that's turning yellow, they are really hard to see. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and here's just some examples of that linear feeding that I was talking about. So you can see that they fed, you know, kind of in a line, um, and that's that type of damage will show up on leaves too. Okay. Uh, lady beetles will eat them. And when I mentioned lady beetles earlier, this is the typical lady beetle that people think of. This is usually the one that you can buy. This is uh, the convergent lady beetle. It's native to the United States. It's a very good predator. Okay. Lace wings will also work. Okay. If they can catch them, they're going to eat them. Predatory mites are available to control thrips. Pirate bugs, as we've mentioned earlier, if they can catch them, they will eat them. All right. Uh, this is the Pyganic label that I mentioned earlier. Again, this is a pyrethrin based product. Uh, it is organic. It is considered an insecticide. Um, so uh, when I talk, when I talk to uh, uh, other uh, producing groups, so master gardeners, those types of things, and we're talking specifically about pesticides. Just because something is organic, organically grown, doesn't mean it's not been uh, had um, pesticides applied to it, right? So all of these things that are being sprayed are considered pesticides, okay? Um, horticultural oils, specifically neem products. And I kind of left this out earlier, but neem, um, neem is a growth hormone mimic. So what does that mean? Well, it um, it interrupts the development process of these insects when you are applying uh, applying it to try to control them. So it prevents them from molting from one life stage to the next. So it prevents their development from one instar to the next instar. Okay. Uh, insecticidal soap will work, uh, and then there's fungal pathogens out there that are available th for thrips. Um, oh, sorry. That's it. That's all I have on thrips. We're moving on. Okay. <laughs> Move on. <laughs> Unless there's questions. No, not so far. Okay. So uh, the last little one I want to talk about here, there, and I'm only talking about one, is um, in, insects with chewing mouth parts. There's a whole slew of things that can impact your garden with chewing mouth parts, but I want to talk about one particularly because it's a problem that I have reoccurring every year. Uh, and that particularly is cabbage loopers, okay? Um, this is the typical inchworm larva. You know, uh, as a kid, wasn't there, a, when you're a kid, wasn't there a song about an inchworm, 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 something or other? Yeah, I don't yeah. think I can <laughs> remember it, but there was. A Abby's closer to, well, yeah. Well, I better just be quiet. I was going to say she's <laughs> the youngest of the bunch, but I think I'm going to get myself in trouble. Um but inchworms, uh, if we, let's see, how do I do this? Inchworms have this typical walking uh, behavior. Motion. Okay. Yep. Uh, caterpillars generally just kind of walk around. This thing inches along as it goes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, the body squunches together and then stretches out, squunches yes. together, where a caterpillar will stay stretched out and will walk with its legs. Thank you, Jeremiah. You put that so much better than I could. <laughs> I, I'm here for you, buddy. <laughs> so here's the weird thing this is the adult okay this is the adult of a cabbage looper um it has this weird little uh 
uh, squid shaped uh, thing on its wing. Uh, and it looks like it's having a bad hair day. The, <laughs> the scales on its uh, back are standing up usually. And it can be confused with Miller moths, right? So Miller moths come through every year. We got to deal with them. Well, these things come with them. Uh, so, you know, if you have a flight of Miller moths, it's highly likely that you will have these things infesting plants. The, the poor little guy that gets confused with them are these little sulfur yellow butterflies. Because usually they're the ones that are flitting around in your cabbage patch. <laughs> the, the, um, these guys are nocturnal, right? So you're normally not going to see them flying around during the day. So they act like a Miller moth. That's why they're confused with them. Yep. Same, same type of behavior, right? So don't blame these little guys. These little <laughs> guys cause their, these little guys cause their own problem. Um, okay. So uh, uh, management options. We haven't talked much about this, but you can cage your plants uh, to prevent things from getting on them. So I understand that this is a pepper plant, but you can actually cage your cabbage or cage your broccoli or those types of things with lightweight muslin fabric or um, floating row cover fabric around cages, those types of things. And it will prevent these moths from laying eggs on the plants. Jeff, really good. Yes. Is this also when you were talking about caging the um, lady beetles, is this how you would also cage those and so that they don't fly away with this sort of system? Exactly. So okay. I have an infested plant here. I've got this type of a cage system. I'm ready to release my ladybugs, put the cage on, slip the lady beetles underneath it, let them go. Right. And if you can keep them on there for about seven days and you know that there are a lot of aphids or food source for them, that'd be fine. But if you start seeing eggs on your plants or on the inside of this cage, let them out. Okay. Let them move on. Yep. But this is like an example of caging a solitary plant, right? A pepper plant, a tomato plant. Yep. But then the floating row covers is something like where I'm doing carrots or uh, lettuce or like multiple, like a lot. Yeah, but you could cut the floating row cover up and make a cage. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So it just becomes a physical barrier between the pest and your plant. And okay. it depends on how tight you make your, your cage around it. It's how good of a exclusion you make yeah yep and so as you're scouting hand removal is a good defensive uh option for you right so um on my on my cabbage plants i will flip leaves and if i see these on them i'll uh terminate them yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. these are big enough where you can see them take them with your hand yeah remove them. yeah, yeah. Uh, and then the last thing, we haven't talked about this much, because we are growing in a controlled space, planting timing is important for a lot of these crops and a lot of these pests. So if you can plant early, right, and if you have a migratory pest that comes through like a cabbage looper, your, your cabbage might be mature enough by the time that the loopers come through to not even be a problem on, right? So you, that's that's another defensive mechanism, okay? Things that you can purchase, spine soldier bugs. <clears throat> mm. uh, they really like caterpillars. I'm going, and the reason that they're called spine soldier bugs is that this little thing right here, can you see that horn on its exoskeleton? Yep. Right there? Yeah, so I'm gonna also say that these things are gonna be really hungry and will bite you. <laughs> given the opportunity so um you know it's a trade-off but they are very voracious predators on um uh, lepidoptera larva okay got a question on uh, do cabbage loopers feed on tomato plants not normally they feed on brassicae type plants so they can get on cabbage sprouts. broccoli brussels oh, sprouts yeah. those types of things yeah not normally tomatoes okay uh, so lacewing larva, uh, predatory mites are available. There are parasites that are available that you can use. Um, I don't think I finished this. Oh, I didn't. Uh, I um, I must have got distracted. Uh, so, so there's some other things too. There's a product that's called Dipel. 
And um, it is a fungal pathogen that you can spray on your cabbage that uh, uh, when the Lepidoptera larvae eat it, uh, it's a bacillus product. Uh, it, it causes them to stop feeding anymore. Um, but again, it's one of those things, it's a timing thing. If you can get ahead of them, it won't be a problem. But if you do get to a point where you're really heavily infested, maybe a treatment might be uh, might work. Um, Carbaryl or 7 um, might be a good option for you. Uh, again, it's a contact insecticide. It can be washed off really easily. Um, but that's other options for those guys. Do you want me to keep going? Yep. Okay. Let's finish her up. Let's, Let's finish her up. There. Okay. All right. So um, let's talk about tuck and roll. <laughs> okay. Uh, who who remembers the Bugs Life movie? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is tuck and roll. I can't remember which one's which. Uh, but anyhow, let's talk about uh, sow bugs and pill bugs. Now, they are two different things. Sow bugs are not roly polies. Pill bugs are roly polies. Remember Meaning, that. Meaning sow bugs don't roll up. Sow bugs don't completely roll up. <laughs> and then uh, everything you thought you knew, these are really going to blow your mind. Okay. <laughs> uh, they are terrestrial crustaceans. So lobsters, they're not insects. They have, they have too many legs to be insects. Uh, they're also called wood lice or wood louse. An individual would be a wood louse. Okay. Um, so the... <laughs> Just looking at their scientific names, so sow bugs, porcelainity, uh, uh, that to me that's like porcupine, <laughs> and armadillium is like armadillo, right? Mm -hmm. So pill bugs roll up. Think of an armadillo; they're they're all armored, but they, they're just bizarre. Their eggs are carried in a thing called a marsupium. Okay. And I think of kangaroos when I think of marsupials. <laughs> uh, so they have a brood pouch. So they, they don't lay their eggs out in the wild. They carry them with them on their bodies. Uh, it takes about three or four weeks of the eggs to hatch, one to three broods per year. So, you know, there's like a thousand eggs per year that they're, one individual is producing. Per female. Um, yeah. Uh, after hatching, the young might stay in the pouch for an additional one to two weeks. Well, getting, yeah. getting nutrients from their parent, all right, through this marsupial fluid. Like, that is just weird. That's not even, <laughs> that's not right. <laughs> and then, then the adults can live two to five years, okay? I am more familiar in my garden space with sow bugs than I am with pill bugs. I have more sow bugs than pill bugs. But people use the terms interchangeably, but they're not the same thing, okay? damage with okay primary i think of these two things as being beneficial because they live in detritus they live in decaying leaf matter uh and they're feeding on this stuff all the time however <laughs> they when they turn bad they can be really really bad my I, i've i've mentioned on this program before i am not a good composter i am not a patient composter so my uh, compost that I use is uh, leaf litter, uh, grass, and it might not be fully composted. So when I'm pulling it out of my compost pile and I'm bringing it in into my high tunnel, I'm actually bringing a lot of these things with them, with it, because uh, they help. They're you know they're working on my compost. They're creating compost for me. Uh, but when they finish that job and the only thing left is the plants in my garden they will wipe out seedling greens I, I replanted greens last year three times okay so you need to be aware that they're out there and if you see them you need to do something about them uh, they also if you have things like strawberries or perennial plants they'll go around and girdle them. they will kill they will kill a strawberry plant uh, so, um, it's, it's just incredible that if they're, if there's, they're in really big numbers, um, they'll, they'll become a problem. So if uh, I see like one or two in my high tunnel, am I concerned about that? One or two, maybe not keep an eye on them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But if they're just kind of everywhere, oh man. Yeah. Um, 
if you have cabbage leaves that are laying on the ground and you pick a cabbage leaf up and it's missing half of it and there's pill bugs or sow bugs on the ground you have a problem <laughs> so you need to you need to do something about it um so some of the things about that reduce the amount of decaying or organic matter in the soil i'm probably not going to do that uh minimize wetness if you can irrigate early right um keep compost and mulch back from plants by building foundations uh you use raised beds or planter, planter boxes i don't really necessarily agree with that particular statement i have raised beds if i'm putting compost in the raised bed but they also crawl around too so they can crawl in and out of a raised bed so uh just it just depends on maybe the substrate of the raised bed not sure uh, but plastic it, it goes back to your stuff above. They like organic matter to eat. They like it damp. They like it cool, kind of wet yep. area. So yep. if you dry it out, yeah, yeah. it gets better. Yeah. Uh, and drip irrigation is better. The one solution I have found, and I again, I am not endorsing this product. I am merely using it as a suggestion because it's the only thing I've found that works. And it's called Sluggo Plus. Uh, the active ingredient it is in it is spinosad. Again, it's got this Omri label on it. It, it is an organic product. Uh, it's a bait. It's a little round pellet or a little kind of oblong pellet. Uh, you sprinkle it out in your garden. Uh, they can uh, they'll consume it, and it'll kill them. So, uh, and the other benefit is it'll control slugs if you have slugs. There you go. Okay. You probably need. Oh, you're done. I'm, I'm at the end. I'm wrapping up. I was going to nudge you, but we probably need to wrap it up. Yep. So uh, thank you for uh, hanging out with me. I try not to be windy, but there's a, we have a whole lot of things to cover when it talks, when we, when it comes to insect management. Uh, and again, this is just scraping the surface, right? There's a whole bunch of other things out there that can uh, impact your garden and your growing spaces. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to call me. Uh, if you have pictures, that's great too. Uh, I can help help identify things pretty well. Um, but uh, I think that's it. I think the bottom line is it's really important to know that if you're growing in a controlled space to be aware, be aware that um, problems can happen. Problems are likely going to happen and they can happen really quickly. So it's important to have your plan in place. Uh, but to to be able to act quickly, yeah. Well, they're going to happen every year too. This is not something. I mean, there'll be worse years than others and things like that. But in 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 closed space growing, you have a better chance of having an issue than right. outdoors. Yeah, my mite problem. I have it every year. I did have one year where I got away with it because it was a more humid, rainy, wet year did not have my problems. Um, so, you know, that could be contributing to some other pest, right? <laughs> right, right. So just be, pay attention, be diligent, have a plan, yeah. be ready, right? And this, yep. uh, this extension bulletin, what's in your toolbox, is a great publication that Jeff put together on this whole topic that we just covered and more. So look it up. It's on the Barnyards and Backyards website. You can download it, call Jeff, he'll get you a copy of it, whatever. The other thing I wanted, just to plug, it, it doesn't fit into this presentation, but I think these people would be very interested, is we have the new fruit and vegetable guide that was produced by Barnyards and Backyards, and that is available in all your extension offices, so get in there and get the resources ready for the growing season. It's that time of year again. Yes, it is. Uh, also, I'll be at the uh, uh, program that's in Riverton next weekend, uh, and I will also be at the uh, Wyoming Bee College the end of the month. I think it's the last weekend of the month in Cheyenne. Correct. Yep. Uh, Correct. So yeah, uh, if you have questions, find me, ask me. <laughs> All right. 
thanks, Jeff, for joining us today. And I don't see any lingering questions now, so I'm sure that people will reach out to you if, if they've got any more. Um, before you take off today, as far our participants take off today, if you would um, complete the evaluation or the survey, Jenny will post those both in the Facebook um, chat and then here on Zoom. That helps us kind of know how we're doing with all the shows. If you, um, Jenny's put up the map here of where all of our county offices are, so you can stop in. If you've got any of these insight questions, people in the offices can help you take pictures, send to Jeff or other folks. This is also a great place to stop in and pick up those resources. Like Jeff has mentioned, the what's in your toolbox. I know that we have some here in our office in Carbon County, and then that fruit and vegetable guide that Jeremiah also mentioned. Um, and we also have four more Barnyards and Backyard Live shows coming up the rest of the month of Arch, March. And so tune in for those. I think that's it. Perfect. Right? All right. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, guys. Thank we'll see you later.